Witches, witches, witches. From just beyond the edge of light, from the deeper darkness where no living being has ever walked, comes the terror of those who have given their souls to the devil. This is the story of one such creature. This is the story of a witch. Across the pages of history lurk the ominous shadows of the werewolves, the sorcerers, the witches. Through the ages, man has known the evil that walks in the shadows of the night and has feared the dark spirits of the unknown. What lies behind these monstrous fears that has chilled the hearts of man since the beginning of time. Do these sinister creatures live only in the superstitious minds of ignorant people? Those who have studied the history of the ages and who know the dark secrets locked in the vaults of time, to them, the word witches brings a trembling fear and a shuddering terror. Great minds have sought to explain these things, and in the great museums of the world hang the work of the master artists of another age, giving mute testimony to the horrors of sorcery and witchcraft as they saw it in their day. To tell you this hideous tale, and to better help you understand these murderous creatures, let's go back 500 years for well, that will bring us back to the time known as the Dark Ages, when the witches held much of Europe in their black grip of fear. And let us study some of the paintings by the great master artists who lived in the age of witchcraft. And through their eyes and the genius of their art, let us try to understand these strange creatures and the evil forces behind them. In the old books, we read that a witch is one who has given his soul to the devil. To do this, they must renounce God and all other things that are decent and good. It is said that they make a pact with Satan written in their own blood. In return for this evil deed, the devil gave them supernatural powers of magic and evil. They could make their bodies disappear or change into any kind of beast or animal at will. They were given the power to cast their ominous shadows across the lives of others. They could cast evil spells upon their victims, causing them to go blind or lose the use of their limbs or even lose their minds. They could turn their victims' lives into nightmares of hell. For the devil is their master and they must go forth upon the earth serving only the powers of evil. The witches would meet in the night at a prearranged rendezvous, usually in old secret dungeons or in the black depth of a forest. These meetings were called Sabbaths and were always held during the night, for the devil's greatest power was believed to be from sundown to cockcrow. And many of the finest paintings by the great artists of that period tell the story more eloquently than words of the strange and evil things that took place at the Sabbath. The witches would appear for this sinister ritual in the form of all kinds of hideous creatures, such as beasts or birds, or half beast and half human. They would begin by celebrating what was known as the Black Mass, which was always conducted by some ex-leader of the church who had renounced God to serve the devil. The Black Mass will live in infamy forever, for here, some of the most terrible criminal acts took place, such as the slaying of children whose warm blood was offered up as a sacrifice to Satan. Then their bodies were thrown to the dogs or roasted and eaten by the witches. Following this ritual, the entire gathering would throw themselves into the most depraved orgies of filth and obscenity conceivable to the human mind. But to these evil perverted creatures, it was all terribly exciting, and it provided an excuse for their unbridled lust and perverted sex. 
The fact that it had to be carried out in utmost secrecy made it all the more thrilling. Yet those same evil murderous creatures who changed their bodies into all sorts of hideous beasts and engaged in those unbelievable rituals by night. Lived by day as ordinary human beings, such as shopkeepers, housewives, or farmers. And as the years went on, the witches continued their murderous assault upon the people. And it is said that they called forth all the legions of the dead to battle for the souls of the living. For this is the goal of the devil. From the beginning of the 13th century through the 18th century, witchcraft ran rampant through Europe and was practiced with all of its blasphemous and obscene rituals. So, the Middle Ages became the Dark Ages, the age of witchcraft, the age of fear. But men and women who still had the courage to fight did so with all the weapons they knew. And after five centuries, the tide of battle turned. In many European countries, the practice of witchcraft was made a capital offense. Rulers decreed that their countries must be freed of this terrible scourge, and that all convicted of practicing witchcraft must die. Armies were called out to hunt down the witches. The fear was so great that entire villages said to be infested by witches were put to the torch. The old records tell of flames rising high into the night sky and hideous creatures streaking across the burning heavens, screaming foul obscenities. When confronted with death, many of the treacherous witches confessed to the most hideous crimes. Even the hardened soldiers who were trained to kill turned away sickened by some of their terrifying confessions. One group of witches alone confessed to the murdering of over 2,000 babies and small children bought from the brothels and slums of the big cities. At last, the witches were no more. Old superstitions and taboos had yielded to the powers of light and knowledge. We, who live in the light of the 20th century, see the witch only in fantasy, as a hideous old woman sailing through the night sky on her broomstick. We are certain that these murderous creatures who walked the world in the Dark Ages, committing their atrocious crimes and casting their evil spells, never really existed, except in the twilight zone of the mind. But are we mistaken? From deep beyond the edge of light, from somewhere out there beyond the grave, beyond the dimensions of life, do these ominous creatures still exist? Let us see. This is the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself gives up contagion to this world. If I could have known of the strange and haunting experience that was waiting for me, 
I never would have driven any further into the hill country of central Texas. There are those who say that it was all a dream and that it didn't happen at all, nor could it happen in the 20th century. But I tell you, it happened. Perhaps you'll be able to believe it if I tell you about where it happened and the people who lived there. To begin with, it was early spring, and there are few places in the whole world as lovely as central Texas in April. But this is not the Texas of cowboy lore, for here, snug in a green valley rimmed by evergreen hills, are trim, clannish, thoroughly German villages. The German settlers came in 1846 seeking religious asylum in America. The green hills, the rocky slopes, and clear rushing streams reminded them of the hills beside the Rhine. From limestone outcroppings in the encircling hills, they built their thick-walled homes, most of them still standing, mellowed to amber by the sun, still occupied by descendants of the settlers. And they have kept the faith that made their grandfathers brave sickness, isolation, and Indian raids so that it be kept alive. A characteristic of the valley is the great number of bells, church bells, the Abendglocken with evening bells. And there are the school bells which have rung for a hundred years calling the children to schoolhouses that were built by their great grandfathers. Though English and German are spoken interchangeably, German is taught in the schools and is still the language of social contact and of the home. And they sing in German. Yes, this was spring, the time of Sangerfest, the singing festival. I was trying to get to the village of Luckenbach, where a singing festival was in progress. You can joke all you want to about how far a sports car can go on a gallon of gas, but when they're out, they'll sit there like any other car. I was already late, so I decided to leave the car and walk into the village. This was the last day of the singing festival and the last day I could take away from college. I was writing a thesis on the early Germans in Texas and the festivals were important to my research. As I walked through the countryside toward the village, I thought to myself how lucky these people were to live in such peace and unspoiled beauty. And yet, as I approached the old Burr Mill on the outskirts of the village, an ominous feeling crept over me. It seemed as if the dark shade trees above the mill race were about to swallow me up and take me back a hundred years, as indeed they soon would. Hello there. The Yates. Uh, I'm looking for a place to stay for the night. I wonder if you could help me. Schoenig's Inn, Mein Bruder Hans, good beer, Wiener Schnitzel. Sounds good enough for me. Kerska. Her name was Kerska. 
It was a pity that such a lovely creature would be the one to tell me that I was too late for the festival. She was dressed in a costume of the old country and had taken some village children to the festival. She said that her grandfather would be glad to have me at the inn. As we turned to go, I couldn't help thinking that the old miller could help me in my search, so I turned to him. He seemed pleasant enough as I asked him if he could help me. But when I mentioned the words superstitions and witchcraft, he simply turned and continued with his grinding. I dismissed the old miller from my mind as overly sensitive, and we started walking through the village toward the inn. I tried to ask Kirska questions about the village, but she was interested in what she called the outside, what it was like at college, what kind of clothes were being worn by girls her age. Suddenly I realized that I was out of place in this village with its century-old homes and clean-swept walks. But as we approached the inn, her mood changed. It was as if she wanted to help me, but couldn't find words to explain how. You must be careful. The old ones do not like to speak of the spirits and her hex. And your grandfather? Grandpapa will be glad to have you in our house. He will talk of anything you wish, and much of what you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That evening, after a good German dinner by the fire, Hans Schoenig, the innkeeper, puffed on his pipe and tried to find words to answer my questions. Ja, mein Bruder, de Müller. The villagers, they are afraid to talk of those days when the spirits were about our valley, especially the Luckenbach witch. The Luckenbach witch? I think I talk too much. Surely, after all these years, there would be nothing if you told me. I will help you when I can, but we must not talk of the witch. But I promise you, I'm not going to say anything to anyone. I'm just interested Good in Good not. I had just about given up hope of any help from anybody. Come in. This water is fresh from the well. Thank you. Oh, uh, do you have to go? I mean, uh, well, I'm not having too much luck with the others, and I thought someone younger might be able to help. Someone like you. More help? With my thesis. I'm doing research for a thesis. They want to help you. If they could be sure it was the German immigration you were writing about. But... Okay, so it's not just about the immigration story. So it's also about customs and legends and strange oddities that we're here about. And witchcraft? Listen, I didn't say anything oh, you about You can be honest with me. All right, so I'm interested in witchcraft and sorcery in the old colony. What's the harm in that? The old folks do not take these things lightly. I didn't mean to upset your folks the way I did. But what can be the harm in a guy researching something that happened over a hundred years ago? You would have to live here to know us to understand these things. You're what we call friender. You're from the outside. They don't trust you. Are they trying to hide something? Don't you? Why are you so interested? It's just an academic hobby with me. I know there's a lot of talk about witches and warlocks and stuff like that, and a lot of people actually believe it. But I've done a lot of research on witchcraft. And I actually believe it can be boiled down to a simple mathematical and economic formula. How do you mean? Look, in any history book, in any age where there was widespread famine, sickness, want, you find an outbreak of women being denounced as witches. In the late Middle Ages, thousands of people were executed in Europe and England. In Massachusetts, 20 witches were put to death. All of these were times of widespread disease and hunger. But when your people first settled in this country, they had not only disease and hunger to contend with, 
they had the Comanche Indian raids as well. Little wonder then that the ugly word witchcraft was heard in the new colony. But what pleasure can you get from studying about all this? To better understand the witch hunts we have today. Witch hunts? You would think that after the delusions of New England and early Texas, the urge to hunt witches would have disappeared from the Western world, but nothing of the kind. The medieval idea of witchcraft was replaced with things like race and nationality. What can I do to help? Your grandfather mentioned the Lukenbach witch, but caught himself when I tried to find out more about her. Now, I've heard of this case before. Can you tell me something about her? There was a woman called the Lukenbach witch. My grandfather and granduncle will not talk of it because it was their grandfather, Schoenig, who denounced her. The settler that built this inn? Yes. In this very room. In that very bed. Don't leave now. I have an old book, very old, which will tell you all about it. But you must not tell the others about the book. You have my word. I'll just be a minute. Kirska. Yes. You have the sweetest smile. Is that what the college boys are telling all the country girls this year? No, I really mean it. I believe you. It's just that uh, I don't ever really notice anyone until they get a little bothered and light up like a candle. You know, with your German good looks set off with something simple and black, you'd look like a little cameo. I'd better hurry. As I finished my packing, I actually felt that my luck was changing for the better. Just how much better, I couldn't describe. You'd have to see her. You said something simple and black. I did? Oh, yeah, I did, I did. Shouldn't you close the door? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I'm not sure I've got you figured. Because I asked you to close the door? Well, uh, yeah, that and I... And you wouldn't want Grandfather to know we were alone? No, I wouldn't. Oh, you didn't think I wanted to be alone with you? No. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not sure what I thought at the moment. I'll tell you. You didn't think little country girls ever thought of being alone and things and life. But, uh... Well, who knows more about life and things and being alone than farm people? Well, I'll be... It's just that farm people don't talk about it too much. Too much talk ruins it. I'll be... <laughs> I'd better give you your book now and go. Because after giving you your book, I have no reason to stay. Except on one condition. And that wouldn't be fair to you. You've knocked, friender. The early Germans in Texas. To understand and properly know how witchcraft and suspicion raised its ugly head in the early colony, Remember that in the first year of the settlement, typhoid, sleeping sickness, and other bitter hardships were climaxed by an epidemic that took the lives of 200 of the 600 settlers. The villagers looked for someone on whom to blame the troubles. What better subject than the widow who walked by moonlight? The widow who was too aloof to speak to the women of the village? The widow who caused the whispers about a clandestine affair with the innkeeper Schoenig? 
the widow witch, they called her. Witch? It must be remembered that this was a time when a man of power could conveniently denounce as a witch any woman discovered with him in his bed. Such a man was Otto Schoenig. Well, Otto? Well, Widow? What excuse is it this time, Otto? What excuse? I have asked you to give me more time, woman. I have given you time enough. You must decide between us. I cannot break charity with my woman while she is infirm. The villagers are talking. I hear their mouthing when I pass their doors. What are they saying, widow? They're saying that I have taken the bed of an invalid wife. They're blaming me for their miseries. The curdling of milk and the spoiling of butter. They say it is the curse of the widow witch. My washerwoman tells me that on Sunday last, the preacher read from the Old Testament, I shall not suffer a witch to live. You must take me away from all this. I cannot break charity with my woman while she is infirmed. You have broken charity with me? What am I? A chattel to be used when convenient? To function where your wife cannot? To lie with, but not to marry? Quiet, woman. Keep your tongue. I'll not be silent. For I fear this talk of witches was born with you. Is it you who have woven this web of spectral evidence about me? Is it you who have called me a witch? Oh, your face belies you, Otto. Would you have me burned? Yes. Yes. Witches are for burning. No. No. Stop your shouting, woman. Let her hear me. Let all hear me. You belie me. The elders are here to learn how you cast your demoniac spell over this house. No! No, you lie! I have told them how you cast your spell over my wife to make her invalid. She is in league with the devil. The widow is a witch. That same night, under cover of darkness, they took the widow to the graveyard. There are those who said that she waited proudly without fear, and that she whispered over and over, Tot, tot all to all the Schoenigs. Death to all Schoenigs. I will tot return. Do Alec and with the self-same spire, I will kill all who bear the name of Schoenig. How convenient for Otto Schoenig that there could be no trial. Death would be by post oak spire. They buried her not a hundred yards from where she had lain with the cruel and deceptive Otto Schoenig.
there it was, the mummified face of the widow with eye sockets staring. And among the crumbling bones, the stake, now petrified stone. What a prize. If I could but take the stake and the temptation was too much.
and one by water. The next morning, the elders came to the inn. They had fished the body of the miller out of the blood-soaked mill pond. There was no question of what had happened, for they had also discovered the empty grave of the witch. I tried to speak up, but words wouldn't form in my mouth. This was all a dream, I wanted to tell them. This thing didn't happen. But as the elder continued to talk, the sudden realization came to me that it was true. I had uncovered a grave of a witch. And now, after 100 years, she had returned to avenge herself. <laughs> The elder warned that no one should leave or enter the village until the witch be found and return to her grave. Surely the witch would not stop at one death. Where would she strike next? The only two villagers with the name of Schoenig were the innkeeper Hans and Kirska. As the moon rose, we did all we could do, bolt the shutters and wait. One by five. I was the guilty party. Just as surely as if I had held the stake, I had killed them. I could no longer contain my guilt. And yet, some kind of power kept me from speaking up. It was as if I was hexed by the witch herself. I made up my mind to find the witch and stop the killing. The librarian must have wondered at my strange questions. Under the guise of research, I asked her if there was some place people could hide in the hills by day, maybe some place where they went to during the Indian raids. Yes, she could help me. There were some caves downstream from the mill. I had my information. And so that night, as the moon bathed the hills with light, I crossed the mill race and headed toward the caves downstream.
but as I watched, fascinated by this beautiful creature, I couldn't believe that here was a vengeful witch who had murdered two and was sworn to kill a third. For a moment, I felt sorry for her. This lonely nymph, whose friends were water snakes in the moon. And she seemed to know every sound of the night. As her eyes met mine, all thoughts of capture or punishment of the witch drained from my mind. I was helpless. Her power and beauty engulfed me, and I found myself completely obeying her will. I followed quietly as she picked up the gown she had torn from Kirska's back.
One by one, one by five, but all shall die by the self-same spy.
Later, in the cold gray light, I spread the dirt over the widow. My feelings were mixed. Here was a woman who had taken two lives. Yet she had been denounced maliciously and killed by the same stake. Was she witch or wronged widow? It is not for me to say. I am only glad that her tempest is over and she has returned to her hundred year sleep.